So when uh, Dr. Arthur Rubenstein and myself were thinking of who should be the distinguished speaker, Dean Speaker this year, it took us a nanosecond to think about uh, who that person is. We immediately decided on inviting uh, Dr. Richard Horton. So therefore, it is absolutely my pleasure on behalf of Dean Larry Jimson, uh, my Dean colleague from the School of Medicine, who is co-hosting co this lecture today with me, and he is going to be speaking at the end, to welcome each and every one of you to this, uh, which will prove to be a very, very exciting presentation. Of those of you who may not know me, I'm Afaf Milis. <laughs> Raise your hands if you don't know me. <laughs> We, are, we would like to welcome uh, this, our guest of honor, our keynote speaker, uh, Richard Horton. And thank you, Dr. Horton, for taking the time, coming all the way from the UK to spend those couple of days uh, with us. I just want you to know that we really all feel very, very honored to have you here and uh, looking forward to hearing you. But before I tell you a little bit about him, I want to put this presentation within a context of how uh, what's behind it and how this came about. The context uh, that drives this is the Lancet report. And I have learned a lot of things from Dr. Horton, but one very important thing I learned is not to say Lancet. It's the Lancet <laughs> report. <laughs> uh, so the report is health professionals for a new century. If I spend a little bit more time with him, I'm going to go back to the, my UK, UK accent. Uh, so the report is Health Professionals for a New Century, Transforming Education to Strengthen Health Professions in an independent, Interdependent World. This is really globality and transformation of education and interconnection are the hallmark of, of this uh, report. Uh, this report comes up from uh, the work of uh, Health Professionals for 21st Century Commission, which was put together by, uh, the, by the Institute of Medicine, actually by the Gates Foundation initially. And it was co-chaired, and continues the co-author talk about it, J Julio Frank, who is the former Minister of Health in Mexico, and he's currently the Dean of School of Public Health at Harvard. And his co-chair, our co-chair, is Dr. Lincoln Chen, who is the president of China Medical Board. So originally, this is the report that came out, and, and then it was put in a book. Um, it was, uh, and I want to say also the Institute of Medicine was uh, definitely a partner in it, and the Lancet uh, Journal is a partner, and that's why Dr. Horton was a very much partner in all that. So discussions about the value and logic of interprofessional education has been with us for a long time. I think some people here say probably there has been, these are all discussions. So why now? Why is it so important now? Why are all the organizations now talking about interprofessional education? According to Holyo Frank and the commission, there are several reasons. We are in an equity and rights revolution. We have we had many revolutions, but right now, everybody is talking about equity and justice. We are also experiencing many proposals for healthcare reform, not only in the United States, but in, in Europe, in China, in many parts of the world. And we live in a very connected global world, and there are so many solutions for our health care issues that are far better coming from other parts of the world, and we need to remember that. So therefore, the report says we must have a robust and powerful dialogues about ways to change the paradigms of education and paradigms of practice, and this is part of this dialogue, and that's what we are about. So we are truly honored to have uh, our keynote speaker today, Dr. Richard Horton, who is the editor-in-chief and publisher of The Lancet, one of the world's premier medical and healthcare journals. Uh, Thomas Wakeley, who was the founder of uh, that journal, said, and I quote, a lancet can be an arched window to let in the light, or it can be a sharp surgical instrument to cut out the dross. And I intend to use it in both senses. There is no question that Dr. Horton has continued and expanded upon the goal of his 
predecessor since assuming the editor-in-chief role in 1995. He's built upon Mr. Wakeley's intent to let the light in by expanding the Lancet reach and by having very sharp opinions in the Lancet. So I first got to know Dr. Horton, of course, through his writings, and then got to know him even better uh, as, as we both served on that uh, commission for the 21st centuries. So to those in healthcare around the world, Dr. Horton is definitely well known for his commitment to education, for his empathy for the underserved, most vulnerable populations, particularly women and children, so much to my pleasure, and social accountability in training health profession. He talks a great deal about accountability of health professional. He's known for his most powerful editorial as a champion for justice and equity in healthcare. He's known for his courage to address vital issues, challenging the status quo, challenging organization, challenging institution, challenging universities. Some of his editorial titles tell it all. The Hippocratic Oath, Despicable Effects and Disgraceful Actions, Disgrace, Mystery, but also Wisdom, The Ten Commandments, G8 Corruption. Uh, if you haven't read some of these, I, uh, they are really pleasurable reading. Uh, he is on a mission to remind us that we are accountable to the larger good, to a social mission to care for people. He is on that mission. He's known for all that, but I had the honor of working with him and witnessing his advocacy and activism, which has been a trademark of his career. There are, these are manifested, his career, this trademark of his career is manifested in uh, very much evident in his formal and informal roles that he plays, which indicates uh, such as his current role as the chairman of the Board of Health Metrics Network, prior roles as the first president of the World Association of Medical Editors and president of the US Council of Science Editors. He's a co-founder and past member of the UK Committee on Publication Ethics. He was a chair of the Royal College of Physicians, working party on physicians and the pharmaceutical industry and co-chair of the World Health Organization Scientific Advisory Board. He has a long and well-known standing interest in global health. And this is reflected in so many of his publications, which include Innovations for Health, Doctors in Society, Second Opinion, and a book called Health Wars, as well as many articles in The Lancet. He is the recipient of so many honors and awards for his significant contributions to health, including honorary doctorate from the universities here in the United States and abroad, MU University is one of them in Sweden, honorary professorship from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, University College um, of London, University of Edinburgh. He received the Dean's Medal from John Hopkins School of Public Health, Medical Publication of the Year by the Medical Journalist Association and the Edinburgh Medal for Contribution to the Understanding of Human Health and Well-Being. His awards list is very, very long. Dr. Horton received his undergraduate degree and medical degree from the University of Birmingham in UK. Please join me in giving him a true pen warm applaud. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I think I should sit down now while the going's good. Um, <laughs> thank you very much indeed to Dean Malais and also to Dean, Dean's, Dean Emeritus Rubenstein and to Dean Jameson for your incredibly generous hosting of these few days here. Um, I should say that, uh, as Afaf mentions, we first met on the Professional Education Commission with Lincoln and Julio Frank. And, you know, there are moments where you meet people and you just, you don't have to explain anything, but you just instantly hit it off. And when that happens, it's very special. And we definitely instantly hit it off and became uh, firm friends and colleagues from that moment on. And it's uh, a real pleasure 
to say thank you to my friend as well as to my colleague um, Afaf Malays. Thank you. To business, though. Uh, last Saturday, uh, I, along with millions of other people in Britain, uh, took my family to a very strange ceremony. Uh, and it's a ceremony to celebrate the near destruction of our monarchy and parliament in 1605. Guy Fawkes, on November the 5th, planted 36 barrels of gunpowder under the house, uh, Houses of Parliament with the intention to destroy uh, the seat of power in that country. And what we do every year is go and celebrate that attempt uh, in our typically anarchistic way in Britain, and we burn an effigy on that bonfire of Guy Fawkes. It's a rather medieval... Uh, ceremony that we in, in, indulge in, which might invite, invite some serious questions as to the sanity of 50 or 60 odd million people who live in Great Britain. But it's very symbolic because it does raise questions about our attitudes to authority, our attitudes to traditional orders, our attitudes to centres of political power. That was last Saturday, and today we're going to burn, I hope, some more effigies, but this time effigies of professional power. And look a little bit at how those centers of authority, of power, are shaping modern medicine, and how they need to change if we are going to truly address some of the global predicaments that scar the moral culture of the world we live in. Now, I've been here a day and a half, and I can tell you I've been scarred by the incredible ambition and enthusiasm that I've met from colleagues, many of whom are here in the audience. You have a remarkable institution at Penn, an institution uh, like no other I have been at, and I go to many institutions. I've, I've never seen the collaborative spirit that I've seen here between different professions in uh, health. It is truly unique what you have. Uh, even at Hopkins, uh, which has a fantastic reputation uh, in the way it brings together its schools of nursing, public health, and medicine, uh, thanks largely to the geographical location of th those three great schools, it's actually the work that you do together that I can see defines you as something very, very special. Uh, but I, you have shocked me this week. Uh, I, I, I've had meetings where uh, I've been told that the future of health in the United States needs to be to eliminate entirely primary care physicians and family practi practitioners and replace them with nurses. <laughs> now, this is a message I will take home <laughs> to the National Health Service. Um, of course, most of whose doctors are general practitioners. Uh, are we ready for that revolution? Well, perhaps we, we should be. Uh, I spend a lot of time worrying about professionalism and what are the, prof the qualities of the professional. And of course, one talks a lot about integrity and honesty and social justice and equity and, and altruism. But in one conversation I had yesterday, I was told, no, it's none of those things. It's all about managing professional conflict which is a very different way to think about professionalism. And I want to address some of those issues around conflict as well. And also, I'm, and I, now I have to make a blanket apology. I, it has also been drawn to my attention, sadly, that The Lancet has rejected a few manuscripts that have come <laughs> from Penn. So, so on behalf of my, uh, of my colleagues, please let me apologize for that. Um, and, and any mistakes we make in the future, uh, let me apologize for those as well. <laughs> it's like that in England, you know, where you ask for all other offenses to be taken into consideration as you plead guilty, and, and I ask for all offenses to be taken definitely into consideration. Back in 1949, the issue of interprofessionalism raised its ugly face in The Lancet. 
two medical students who were working at the London Hospital Medical College wrote in angry repost to the journal. In our hospital, a scheme will shortly be introduced whereby students will give up three weeks of their course to do general nursing tasks under the supervision of ward sisters. We feel strongly that such expenditure of time is ridiculous. They were joined in support from one physician who said, my own sympathy and support goes to the student. Short to be handing out medicines and milk puddings, it just isn't worth it. Another medical student wrote also in support, there are many eminent physicians and surgeons at the London Hospital. The student who acquires only a fraction of their wisdom will be of greater service to his patients than 10 ward sisters. Well, that was 1949. Thank the Lord. The editor took a different view. Theodore Fox, who was the editor at the time in the typically English understatement, said, we cannot share this view, <laughs> which seems to us to reflect a regrettable bias given to the doctor's professional outlook by current training. Well, Afaf has mentioned this Commission on Medical Professionalism, and there's Julio Frank and Lincoln Chen. And this report, and let me say, we were privileged to publish it, but it was a report that, as Afaf says, was funded largely by the Gates Foundation and had many distinguished individuals from countries around the world. And what this report concluded was there is an emerging crisis in the way we think about the delivery of care by health professionals. And the current status quo that we have simply cannot continue. What this report tried to do was to draw not just the notion of interdependence between peoples, between nations, but an interdependence between professions in a way that I think, although many of you will be, will be familiar with this, for many others, these are issues of acute, that cause acute anxiety and tension. Three reports were drawn attention to. Of course, last year was the 100th anniversary of Flexner, which in that report really invented modern medical education. But there were other reports as well, the Welsh Rose Report on public health and the Goldmark Report looking at nursing and nursing education in the United States. And this interdependence between these three great professions and other allied health professions, it was really the, the central argument in this publication. What the commissioners identified was a revolution in the way we think about the provision of services by professionals. Science was the core of Flexner's vision and rightly so, the creation of academic medical centers. The curriculum became driven by scientific advance and was largely based in institutions like Penn, universities. We then moved more to a problem-based approach, problem-based learning, which has had many critics, and many critics in the United Kingdom uh, exist today. But those were centered less on universities more on academic centers and teaching hospitals. And that's very much the prevailing model we have in Britain, largely across Western Europe, and I, and I think to a large extent here too. But we're on the edge of another revolution in the way we think about health professionals and the delivery of care. And it's a revolution that's based not on tribes, of professionals, a revolution that's not based even on the great advances in science. It's a revolution based upon need. It's a revolution based on that individual, very often professionals, certainly many doctors in my country, don't talk about very much, the patient. What is it that the patient needs from a health system? What is it that the patient demands from health professionals. And that approach, that patient-centered approach, 
invites us to think much more about competencies from the local to the global level and how we create systems, not just in medicine, but in the way we deliver education that meets the needs of those patients. And let us put this in a global context, because I do want to go beyond our own uh, sometimes narrow borders. We face not just an emerging crisis uh, globally. We are living through a health crisis in the majority of the world today. This simply looks at the numbers of doctors, nurses, and midwives across the world and adjusts the size of continents according to where the provision of those professionals are. And of course, what you see is, an, is a desperate lack of professionals in Africa and Asia and a relative abundance of professionals in countries like our own. And we, as professionals, surely do have a responsibility to think very carefully and thoughtfully about our obligations in this, within this notion of interdependence to these other countries. Now, the way we have thought about training, the dominant model of training, which is still common, certainly I would say the norm in Europe, maybe a little different in this institution and elsewhere in the United States, is that we rapidly become enveloped within our particular tribal culture, whether it's within medicine, nursing, public health, or an allied health profession. And only afterwards, only after we've been thoroughly um, gone through our hazing procedure in our profession, do we emerge uh, and then think about how or whether we're going to work as a team. An interprofessional model, which, again, is sometimes mentioned but rarely implemented, thinks very differently about that, thinks much more about competences that are required, demanded by the patient, and thinks about how we put together a curriculum, uh, an educational system that addresses the needs of the patient, irrespective of the professional cadre we are talking about. And then there are other ways to think about transprofessional ed education, and I'll mention those a little later. But let us just set this context, because I do want to, it's very easy sometimes to get um, diverted by our own local political debates. Um, I do want to set this in the context of the international predicaments that we, we face. Now, Global health has taken off in the last decade in the most remarkable way as a, as a subject. No self-respecting school of medicine, it seems, um, can continue without creating its own department of global health, center of global health, faculty, whatever it may be. Why is that? Um, partly it's, be it's inspired by a, a kind of moral recalibration of the university to recognize that it has an international dimension to its work. But it's also about the money, uh, because there is an enormous amount of money that has now gone into global health. This chart uh, that comes from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle, Chris Murray's group, looks at the growth of expenditure in global health since 1990. From around five billion US dollars then, to almost 27 billion US dollars in 2010. And even though we are going through a global economic recession, we are seeing growth of this global health spending by around about 7% per year. In the last three or four years, it was 17%. So it, the growth has decreased dramatically, but it is still growing. And you can see perhaps where this is coming from. It's coming not just from governments. The United States is the biggest donor in global health today, and we should be very grateful for that. But it's also coming from other sources, such as foundations like the Gates Foundation, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, the Global Alliance on Vaccines and, vaccines and infant, uh, Immunization. There are these multiplicity of institutions now that fund health. The question then is, have we as professionals caught up with the way this money is being spent? And I don't think we have. Let us just briefly 
write a report card on where we are in global health today. There are, as you will know, a set of millennium development goals, goals that were agreed in 2000 by 190-odd nations that committed those nations to achieve certain targets by 2015. They were a political commitment, but they were also a moral commitment too, a remarkable moral commitment to make the world a better place. There are three core health-related goals. One, MDG4 on child survival, a second, MDG5 on maternal health, and a third, MDG6 on AIDS, tuber tuberculosis, and malaria. And this map shows our progress in relation to under five child mortality. And what it's showing is where we are making progress and where we are not. The dark blue areas are where the MDG for child survival will be met. And you can see that China will meet it, Brazil will meet it, and some countries in North Africa will meet it. But you can also see where the majority of countries are that will not meet it, and indeed will not meet it for decades after 2015. Most of sub-Saharan Africa is a generation or two behind where it needs to be. So increasingly we see as the world becomes richer, as we do make progress scientifically and technically in health, the focal point of our concern is going to become more and more and more sub-Saharan Africa and to some extent South Asia as well. If we then look at MDG5 and we look at progress on reducing maternal mortality, we should say we have achieved some great successes. If you look at the top line there, you will see that since 1990 there has been, especially over the last decade or so, a, a slow but steady reduction in maternal deaths from around 500,000 20 years ago to now actually around 270 odd thousand, about 50,000 uh, of which are driven by HIV AIDS. So we are seeing real progress here. And yet we should put this into context that we should not be having almost 300,000 women dying during pregnancy and childbirth in the world today. These are deaths that do not need to take place. They are virtually every single one of them is preventable. And it is a desperate report card on all of us as professions, health professionals, that this remains the case. If you then think about where we are with AIDS and tuberculosis, we've made incredible strides in AIDS. The peak of the AIDS epidemic took place really in the late 90s, early 2000s. And we are seeing a slow but steady decline in numbers of new HIV infections and AIDS-related deaths. And that is a remarkable achievement. And the result is, of course, we are seeing more and more people now living with HIV, around 34, 35 million people on the planet living with AIDS, thanks to uh, the rollout of ART, antiretroviral therapy. At the same time, if one thinks about tuberculosis, we've actually made very little systemic progress. It's incredible that there are still 9 million new infections with TB in the world every year. 9 million. That, I mean, that's a huge number. And when you see our, our utter failure to address tuberculosis successfully has now led to new epidemics of multidrug resistant tuberculosis with a declining arsenal of antibiotics to address TB, which puts us in an extremely perilous situation with one of the oldest infectious diseases known to uh, man and woman. So some progress in some places, but largely the report card looks very unfavorable. If we then look at malaria, which is another component of MDG6, Millennium Development Goal, Development Goal 6, again we see a very interesting global situation. So the green areas are where we don't have malaria, and other than imported transmission. The blue areas are where we could eliminate malaria, 
and the red areas are where we have endemic malaria and we can't hope to eliminate it yet. We just have to think about how we can control it. But if you look, there's almost a ring around that red. And so there's a real possibility that we could contract the map, the global map of malaria, if we were really re trying to have a concerted effort. In 2007, I think it was, Melinda Gates at a malaria meeting also in Seattle put out a challenge to all of us to eradicate malaria from the planet. We eradicated smallpox. We're on our way to eradicating polio. Could it be that we could eradicate malaria? When you look at a map like that, it looks almost impossible to think about that within a generation. And although it's not a perfect vaccine, the data recently reported on the GlaxoSmithKline Gates vaccine do give us a glimmer of hope that we might be inching our way towards understanding the biology of vaccines in malaria a little better so that we could, perhaps within a generation, see the blue areas expand and the red areas begin to um, contract a little bit. But overall, what we're seeing when you look at the MDGs is a report card of some progress, but much to do. There are other issues which we too often neglect in global health, and nutrition is one of those. It's forever there, but we rarely address it directly. And if you look at countries with the highest burden of nutrition, they are, again, sub-Saharan Africa, countries in the Middle East, an area of the world that we neglect far too much in global health. Asia and some countries in the Southeast Asia, Western Pacific region as well. And nutrition is a driving determinant of deaths among women and children in particular. And yet we have a broken global nutrition system. And in all the meetings I go to in global health, and there are probably too many of those, nutrition is rarely addressed directly. It's, it's like the orphan child in global health today. If that's the orphan child, this is the orphan child twice or three times removed, and that's reproductive health, family planning. And this figure just shows trends up to early mid-2000s. And while funding for AIDS rightly increased, you can see how funding for family planning, the blue diamonds, and for reproductive health uh, either stagnated or fell in real terms. And recently we... I hope it was celebrated, uh, 7 billion people on the planet. By 2050, we'll have 9 billion people on the planet. And the area of the world that will see the biggest growth in population will again be sub-Saharan Africa. There is no part of the planet less prepared to deal with the explosion of population that they will see than sub-Saharan Africa. So what we're seeing is a, is a concatenation of events, a concentration of burden of disease in Africa, driving determinants of that disease, such as nutrition, which are just simply not being addressed by the global community, and spending patterns that simply are creating a, a powder keg that will explode in a generation if we don't do something to address it very soon. So this brings us back to the question of people because as much as we need a vaccine for AIDS and a vaccine for malaria, as much as we need to have new drugs to treat tuberculosis, as much as we need to roll out technologies where technologies are not available, as much as we need to get antiretrovirals to those who need them, how is any of that going to happen? It's only going to happen by people like you and me. It's going to happen through health professionals. So one of the absolute critical missing elements in this debate about global health is who? And we barely talk about that. And the Professional Education Commission that we've already mentioned touches on some of these themes, but it's only the 
prologue to a much, much bigger set of issues. This looks at the number of medical, this graph shows the number of medical schools in the world. And you can see here how few we have where we need them. When you look at the distribution of public health schools, we have a similar pattern. It's like the inverse care law that Julian Tudor Hart talked about in terms of provision of health services in the UK all those years ago. We have an inverse care law in professional education around the world. When we did this commission report, we wanted to have a map of nursing schools. Uh, we had medical schools, we've got public health schools, we wanted one of nursing schools. Truth was, we couldn't even find the data on where nursing schools are in the world. We value nursing, I'm afraid, in global health terms so little that we don't know where all the nursing schools are, how many nurses are being produced by those schools, and where they're being produced and where they're going. So, again, that lack of information unfortunately shows that while we get wildly excited about a new malaria vaccine, we care very little about the people who are going to be delivering that vaccine. Now, let's just step back and turn to our own histories because there are some interesting clues to the way we might address some of these issues by looking at our own histories. When I look back, again, I'm drawing my sources here rather domestically from The Lancet, but I look back at the way America addressed some of these issues when it saw a nursing shortage. Now, when I came, when I was planning this talk, I didn't know that I was coming to a, a global center of excellence for nursing history. So I'm now standing here <laughs> very nervously and I'm going to be very careful not to make any definitive statements um, about the history of nursing. Uh, however, what was reported here in 1942 in The Lancet was how America, at certain times of it in its history, certainly did have a concerted effort to go out and search for nurses because it recognized there was a national predicament in terms of its human resources for health. Although the way we, maybe you, but the way we certainly portrayed it was slightly odd. The opportunities open to them, nurses, range from bedside nursing to deanship of a university school of nursing, or maybe, goodness knows where this came from, hostess on an aircraft to directing 3,000 nurses in municipal hospitals. Well, let's look on the good side of that. Um, a nursing qualification means that you can be qualified to do a whole range, take on a whole range of leadership positions, not necessarily just in, in nursing. Um, and, I, and I strongly believe, actually, that a medical, and I was speaking about this with somebody yesterday, um, a medical degree, too. You don't just have to go into medicine with a medical degree nor a nursing degree. It gives you a fantastic training to do things outside of the health professions. But today we're talking about the health professions. When we look at what's taking place in the UK in modern times, there are also important clues to what we need to address. Right now in Britain, there's a crisis in the nursing profession, and there is a crisis in the relationship between the nursing profession and the medical profession. And this crisis has erupted in the last two months. It's driven by a perception, partly because of some controversial examples of uh, scandals of poor care in a few hospitals. This is not a systemic issue, but a few bad examples have created an impression that we have falling standards of nursing care. It has been suggested that there has been a loss of the care ethos in nursing in Britain today. There certainly has been an increased number of complaints about the way we deliver care. But that's not just for nursing, that's for doctors as well. And what people have tried to do in the last couple of months is to look at these scandals, to look at the number of complaints, to look at the failures in the system, and to try and decide where the responsibility lies. 
Jonathan Waxman is a very famous, in my country at least, oncologist. And this is a piece he wrote recently in The Times, which is mostly a pretty good newspaper, um, although it is owned by Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> What's the point of nurses if they don't care for the sick, Dr. Waxman wrote. And let me just read you this opening paragraph. I must be mistaken, but isn't caring for the sick a job for nurses? Not according to Dr. Peter Carter, General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing. He wants patients' relatives to free up nurses by feeding and caring for their loved ones in hospital. It is about helping Gran to get out of bed and go to the loo, as he put it. But aren't nurses meant to look after patients? More than a decade ago, to encourage recruitment and save costs, nurse education was restructured. Instead of the traditional three-year-long apprentice-style training that had evolved over centuries, student nurses were taken out of the wards and their training radically altered to become a degree course. Well, what a strange story. He's arguing that improving the professionalism, the quality of nursing education, has actually led to a catastrophic loss in quality of care by that profession. And I haven't quoted his entire article, but that is what he goes on to make the case for. Other articles have appeared articles have appeared in the press making similar points. Nurses with degrees still need to learn the basics of caring. What we're seeing is a radical assault on progress that has been made in nursing, often very, very tough fights to strengthen the quality of nursing over recent decades. We're seeing an assault on that progress by fellow health professionals in medicine. And in my country, this is creating tension that is boiling over into a professional war. Interprofessionalism means war, not real collaboration right now. If we then look in other countries, we see a situation that's so radically different that we do have to question, what is the direction we're going? Aaron Motsualidi is the Minister of Health in South Africa. And just a few weeks ago, he announced 1.2 billion rand that would be spent on revitalizing nursing colleges. Why? Because the solution to the health crisis in South Africa is not in training more doctors, although that would be nice. It's actually in rapidly expanding the number of fully qualified nurses. People tell me the healthcare sector is not going to work, but it has to work because over 80% of our population rely on the public healthcare sector. It feels like we are fiddling in Britain while the rest of the world burns. Now, of course, your report that came out of the Institute of Medicine the Future of Nursing, Leading a Change, Advancing Health, which I know several of you in the room were involved with, took an entirely different approach to the kind of debate that we're having in Britain today. The Vice Chair, Linda Bruins bolton wrote, transforming the nursing profession is a crucial element to achieving the nation's vision of an effective, affordable healthcare system that is accessible and responsive to all. And one of the crucial recommendations, of course, is as you know better than I, was actually the, ex the extension of the, the increase in numbers of nurses who go through the baccalaureate. So rather than retrenching on that, rather than seeing higher standards and higher quality of education as something that's good for the nation, as you do, my country sees that as something that's undermining the quality of care we provide to patients. And you do really think, are we living on the same planet when you see these utterly divergent views? But they are utterly divergent. Now, this week, your Supreme Court is meeting to decide whether it should hear challenges to, I was reminded this week that it's not just the Affordable Care Act, it's the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. 
I attended a lecture by Zeke Emanuel, who's now one of your faculty, of course. Um, and he gave this lecture in which he talked about the Affordable Care Act as a world historical event, which I found a, a profoundly moving and inspiring way of framing what President Obama has achieved. And what Zeke said was, you've just got to look at, at what, is, what is the aspiration of this act. It really is about making health the right of every citizen in the United States. Now, it's true, it's not going to be 100%, but it's well over 90% of people who will have access to health care in a way that they don't today. It really is about building an evidence base for health care that simply hasn't existed in the way that it's envisaged in the Affordable Care Act. It is about, he argues, improving coordination between different parts of the health system in totally original ways. And the holy grail of modern healthcare systems. We can do all of this and save money. Now, I'm not sure about the last point, because that does seem to me the holy grail that nobody's ever reached. But the ambition of this act, to me as an outsider, and you, I'm sure you will all have your own, your own views, and it's an interesting issue to discuss, but the ambition of this act, to me, is nothing short of transformational. I mean, I, I find it inspirational to see a leader put health at the top of the political agenda in the way that he has done, especially after the, um, the terrible, uh, you know, efforts which came to nothing under President Clinton. And Zeke said it wouldn't have happened without President Obama. Now, a crucial part of meeting the objectives of the Affordable Care Act, of course, is through nursing, through expanding the nursing work workforce and enhancing the quality of that workforce. And what Donna Shalala, she put it very well. Schools of nursing in collaboration with other health professional schools should design and implement early and continuous interprofessional collaboration through joint classroom and clinical training opportunities. So if you want to put health as a human right in your society, as President Obama wants to do, and if you want to achieve that kind of universal coverage, you've got to have this kind of ambition if you're going to deliver on that promise. And that is a message that's not just relevant to the United States, it's relevant to my country, but much more importantly, it's relevant to those countries in Africa, Asia, some parts of the Western Pacific and Latin America that are so desperately in need of trained health professionals. The United Nations tried to figure out what the impact would be if we had the right number of professionals and they looked at, this was a report that was released in Durban earlier this year, they looked at maternal deaths and newborn deaths. In the world today, when, the, when they were making their calculations, this number's a little high, but it's instructive. In the world today, when they calculated this, around 400,000 maternal deaths. If you had services provided in a primary care setting by nurses and midwives, we'll come to midwives in a moment in more detail, you could avert well over half of those maternal deaths. If you look at newborn deaths, about 3.5 million newborn deaths every year, if you had the right number of nurses and midwives also deliver newborn care, you could save a remarkable 2 million newborn deaths every year, almost two-thirds. So... And the services that they provide are set out at the bottom of this slide. It's within our power. We don't have to invent new vaccines and new technologies, actually. It is within our power with the technologies we already have if we had the right people in the right place to save millions of lives from totally unnecessary, painful, tragic deaths. Now... Midwifery is a very, very important part of this. And by midwifery, I'm talking about the range of midwifery services. And this gets us to a difficult area. And it's an area that I, I would, if it's possible, 
love us to talk a little bit about because there's a problem here about the way we think of professions. So this is Bridget Lynch, and you will know her, and she is the most passionate advocate of midwifery services I have ever met in my life. And she, in Durban, she walked that stage and she held 3,000 midwives in the palm of her hand. And she mobilized them and got them whooping and cheering. And it was, it was, it was like a religious event, actually. It was absolutely, it was incredible. And all power to her, because she's mobilizing a global movement for midwifery. Now, her view is that this is a fight for creating a global profession of midwives. It's about autonomy. It's about getting the education right, the baccalaureate. It's about getting the right regulatory procedures in place. It's about building capacity. It's about science. And she stood on that stage and at multiple times kept shouting, Viva the midwives! And the whole audience shouted back, Viva the midwives! <laughs> but it's interesting, the, her critique. She's, she, her premise is that midwives have become more and more invisible. And what I didn't know until I went to this meeting in Durban was the tensions between nurses and midwives. And what a lot of midwives there were arguing was that nurses have encroached upon the territory that midwives think, midwives think should be their own. And one of the threats to midwifery is actually coming from nursing. So within medicine, we're very used to tribal turf wars. But what we're seeing now is... In global terms, a tribal turf war between different parts of what could broadly be called nursing professions. We wasted time on the notion of skilled birth attendants, she said. We must not leave it to others to represent midwives. There she's talking about nurses. We must be fully autonomous healthcare providers. This is the time in the history for midwives to take our place. This was about building a profession of midwives. Now, if I look back at the way a journal like The Lancet covered issues around nursing historically, we actually, well, I mean, it was quite surprising to me, but The Lancet was almost a nursing journal 50 or 60 years ago. We had articles and letters about the existential meaning of nursing. We covered issues around crises in nursing provision. We had articles about debates that were taking place in nursing. There, there were nursing back in the early part of the 20th century. You had to be um, part of the Church of England in some hospitals in order to be a nurse. Um, so very strangely, uh, we had this kind of religious sectarianism in nursing. We had these sort of philosophical questions about, well, what is nursing, 1948? We really, really took nursing very seriously in a journal like The Lancet. There was a kind of holistic view about the way we saw medicine, nursing, and other health professions working together for a common cause. But that's changed. Um, we even had articles looking at the global dimensions of nursing here, nursing in Africa papers looking at nursing services in African countries. We even, and we don't publish very much now, we even publish nursing research. But something has changed. And although it's good, it's also potentially bad. When I look up, when I looked up the word interprofessionalism in PubMed before, when I was preparing this talk, I found lots of papers in journals such as these, journals that I'm ashamed to say I've not read. Um, I wouldn't even know what they look like because they're not part of my normal reading literature. The professionalization of nursing, which has been such a good thing, the, the, the academic growth of nursing, has created this forum nursing journals, where the research and debates about the future of nursing can take place. The downside of that is that journals like The Lancet, and maybe other journals as well, have abdicated our interest and responsibility and obligation to think about 
health and health provision in its totality. We have lots of articles that are relevant for doctors, but almost nothing that is about allied health professions. And that seems to me to be an unfortunate downside. I was part of a working party that the Royal College of Physicians ran in 2005. I wrote the report, although I, I didn't chair the report. That was chaired by somebody else, and I'll show a picture of her in a moment. Where we put the recognition and importance of interprofessional issues as a central component in our understanding of modern medical professionalism. But we said then, and it's still true today, that doctors have not spent sufficient time learning from other members of the healthcare team. And Julia Cumberledge, who's a baroness in the House of Lords, we still have aristocrats in Britain, wrote, collaboration between professional groups is short-lived, unstructured, opportunistic, fragmented, and rushed. The idea of a clearly defined healthcare team is a myth in search of a manager. I had the privilege today to go and visit life. Um, and rarely have I seen a healthcare team work in such harmony to such good effect. It's a truly inspiring, um, not only idea, but initiative, uh, one I will certainly take back and write about when I, when I get home. But here we have a set of issues that we urgently need to address, and we still haven't. Despite what you do at Penn, the rest of the world is not like Penn. What you have done here, and this is actually from a paper written by Vic Victor Zhao at Duke, but you've done it better than Duke, I think. <laughs> and you can quote me, because I think, you, I, I think from what I've seen, you have done it better than Duke. We've moved from the Academic Health Science Center to the Academic Health Science System. And this idea that you go from discovery translational research through clinical research, adoption of that research in practice, and then to global health, that notion of a local to global system is one that you live. Life is an example of your local commitment to integrating the university, the nursing school, the medical school, in your own community. Now, I've not seen anything like that in Britain, I've got to say. I've not seen anything like that. It's, it's remarkable. But you also have global ambitions and reach in what you do too. You are an academic health science system integrating different professions, different categories of knowledge, all with this moral objective. And it's so urgent. Let's go back to South Africa for a second. A month or so ago, the Ministry of Health released a report saying what their human resource gaps were. And here they are. Right now, today, there are 20,000 staff nurses short, 22,000 professional nurses short. These are the differences between um, nurses, I think, with baccalaureates and those without. A few thousand doctors short, more medical specialists short, and a large number of community health workers short. That's the scale of the gap that we have to fill. And thinking about if every institution like Penn in high-income countries worked in partnership with countries like South Africa, what might we achieve? And it's not just about doctors and nurses. It's also about community health workers, different cadres of health workers. And we should expand our vision for what we mean by professionals, because it's not just about us. Jeff Sachs produced a report recently from his Earth Institute at Columbia calling for one million community health workers. If we could only have one community health worker for every six or 700 rural inhabitants, that would accelerate progress towards the MDGs. So I have a proposal for you. In 1932, the Lancet did a commission on nursing, would you believe? Uh, and the commission on nursing was created because there was a crisis in, health in the health professions in Britain at that time. It was chaired by this rather frightening looking man. <laughs> we don't do moustaches like that today, do we? <laughs> you know some people who have moustaches? Well, that's... The goal of the commission was to restore the popularity of nursing among educated girls. It's the style of language at the time. And they looked at the gap, 
the costs of training, issues around salaries, hours, conditions, and education. We've sought to eliminate anomalies, unnecessary hardships, and interferences with personal freedoms, he wrote. Now, let's think about that in global terms today. Go back to the slides I showed on child survival, maternal health, AIDS, TB, malaria, nutrition, family planning, reproductive health, and so on and so forth. Think about the gaps in human resources, including community health workers in South Africa. And then think about what this commission did. So here's my proposal. Would Penn, because I do think you are doing something that's unique, would Penn, with us, lead a commission looking at human resources for health at a glo in global terms, addressing these issues of inter- and trans-professionalism, but not in an abstract way. I think our, our commission was great, but it was really quite theoretical and abstract in, in what it was looking at. It didn't get down and look in detail, the kind of detail of, well, how many thousands of community health workers and nurses and midwives and so on do we need? What actually is it we need to do in countries? Let's be specific about this. You know, if we were going to a policymaker tomorrow, we wouldn't show them a chart of the history of interprofessionalism and systems-based, problem-based learning. We need to go and tell them, this is what you need to do now, how much you need to spend, and this is what it will deliver. So would you join me in creating a commission, a Penn Lancet commission, looking at human resources in health to address global injustices in health around the world today. I hope you will, and I'll look forward to it if you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Horton. Uh, for those who I've not met, I'm Larry Jamison, the Dean of the Perlman School of Medicine. You've done a really wonderful job of talking about the breadth of health problems that we face globally and putting forward some possible solutions and, and underscoring how interprofessionalism is, is part of the pathway uh, to these solutions. And many of you have heard about or read Tom Friedman's book on how the world is flat. Uh, as we've seen travel from, from Europe to the United States uh, to first prove that wrong, we're now rediscovering it, and how tightly linked we all are to the rest of the world. And there's some obvious areas like infectious diseases, and we recognize how readily they're, they're transferred and how the discoveries uh, in westernized and industrialized countries can help bring solutions, whether they're vaccines or drugs, to other parts of the world. But you've also underscored the importance of, of maternal and child health. Um, I'm personally impressed by the, the challenge of un undernutrition that you talked about. And in my travels in Africa, I was shocked, frankly, to see you know, children who had hemoglobins of five and bloated abdomens and a listless uh, look, who within a couple of days could be turned around by just you know, fundamental nutrition. And it helps them fight their d the diseases and uh, trauma, whatever might afflict them. So the, the solutions are at hand, but we need to, uh, to work hard to apply these solutions. So I also want to thank uh, Arthur and Afaf for this lecture series that they kicked off by tradition, and I certainly welcome uh, continuing this tradition going forward. So why don't we uh, take some questions for Dr. Horton? of the two nursing commissions. There, you didn't mention it, but at the same time we had a nursing commission. There was a nursing commission also in the UK. And as you mentioned, the headline here is, let's let nurses do more. Let's be more serious about their ideals. Let's let them lead. And the headline from the nursing commission in the press was, nurses are unkind. We have to fix nursing because nursing is the source of all of our problems in the NHS two very opposite. 
And so having worked in both countries, how much of this do you think has to do with, I would say, the lack of health services and outcomes research that focus on, on nursing and any source of funding for such things, and also the seemingly lack of interest, and I will apologize if this affronts you, in publishing nursing research in the main journals in Europe so that it's not well known that there is an evidence base suggesting a different uh, conclusion. I, th I think you've put your finger on definitely part of the problem. I think, you know, I do think it comes down to one word there, and that's leadership. Um, one of the things that, just in 24 hours of being here, you know, you have incredible academic and professional leaders in nursing that stand shoulder to shoulder with their colleagues in biomedicine. And that just doesn't happen in the United Kingdom. Uh, nursing education tends to take place not at centers where medical education take, tends to take place. It tends to take place in universities that are not regarded as the equal of your, the equivalent that we have of your Ivy League universities, what we call Russell Group universities. There's a divorce right from day one between the training of nurses, I mean, a physical, we, the, so, we're talking over lunch with you and your colleagues, and we talked about spatial literacy. Well, there's a spatial divide between nurses and doctors from day one of their training. And that inculcates a hierarchy because the universities where nurses train are regarded as less good as the universities where doctors train. And it breeds an elitism amongst the medical profession and a, a quietness amongst the nursing profession. There's not a strong research tradition. Obviously, there are a few exam you know, examples of great nursing researchers in the UK, but not like you have here. It's not a professional cadre that's strong, with a strong voice um, at all. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, you appoint nurses, elect nurses to the Institute of Medicine and are proud to do so, and Harvey Feinberg is proud to do so. Um, our academies of medical sciences don't do that um, and get very anxious about even talking about non-doctors and non-scientists who, who might get elected. So I think there's, there's a real gap in leadership, and um, it's partly structural, but it's also partly, I think, because the nursing profession has been almost battered into a position of submission and received no, I mean, the relationship between Afaf and Arthur here has clearly been pivotal in building a relationship between the nursing and medical profession at Penn. There's no similar example that I've seen like that in the, in the UK. So that willingness for partnership, that leadership, that's where the gap is. And when Jonathan Waxman writes that kind of derogatory article about nursing, where's the professor of nursing to write the response article back? There's nothing. There's no response. So we have a, a vacuum of, of academic leadership. I mean, it's, it's desperate. I mean, maybe, you know, it would be great if some of you could emigrate to the UK <laughs> and go and fill that vacuum. I think some people would like us to immigrate. To <laughs> if, if you get frustrated enough, you're always uh, welcome to come and join us. Oh, Richard. wow. <laughs> Arthur. So, Richard, I want to thank you for a really wonderful lecture that was really very exciting. And uh, Afaf and I and uh, Larry now are always delighted to have people of your eminence here. So I just want to say it's a very special occasion. Um, so just a few short comments. If you would write to Victor Zhao on our behalf, that would be really great. <laughs> he's the Chancellor at Duke, and he's always telling me how great Duke is. <laughs> and I tell him how great Penn is, but here we have an objective third party. <laughs> so that would be great. Uh, on a more serious note, um, you know, one of the problems I have, of course, is beguiling to have a commission uh, with you that the leaders at Penn now would uh, embrace. Uh, but the challenge, I think, uh, in reading many of the articles that you have uh, 
accepted and published in The Lancet and uh, listening to some of the global issues that you talked about here is uh, healthcare is so different in so many countries in the world, mm -hmm. even between Canada and America, never mind Europe and England. And then when you go to Africa and Asia and so on, uh, it's almost like healthcare is local and the needs are local, although of course there is generalized principles. So I just worry that generalized commissions are always going to say these platitudes of uh, general policy, but in terms of the challenge you said was how do you get specific and implement these things numbers-wise, economically, uh, in various structures, it would seem to me an enormous challenge just to get one's hand around that in a practical sense. And I'd just be interested in your comments about how one could even think about doing that. You're absolutely right. Everything is unique in a country. So the way I would see it is that one one has a would have a narrative commission report that does set out principles, but then would have five or six case studies of countries where you can go into huge detail, a little bit like the South African example I gave. Uh, there was a very good book published a few weeks ago called Good Health at Low Cost from Martin McKee and uh, Anne Mills at the London School of Hygiene. And that took five case studies, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, um, well, it wasn't a country but a state, Tamil Nadu, and there was one other, um, and looked at how they've achieved good health at low cost, and then tried to draw out general lessons from that. Well, now, one could envisage setting up teams of colleagues here par in partnership with people in countries which looked at what are the human resource needs and how would one actually achieve those needs. Um, maybe a couple from Sub-Saharan Africa, one from Asia, one from Latin America. Um, and then use that as the basis for drawing general conclusions. So I think one can do both and there are examples of reports that have been incredibly influential to do both. So I recognize the difficulty, but I think there are solutions. Um, I'm Marjorie Mack. I'm, um, we'll meet you tomorrow. Uh, I do assistant, um, I'm the assistant dean for global health in the School of Nursing. Right. Um, I love your idea about having this um, collaboration. But I, I wonder about the stumbling blocks of financing the education when I look around at the developing world in particular. Yeah. I mean, I know of nursing schools in some sub-Saharan Africa where the nursing students actually leave nursing school because they see the medical students being treated with such privilege that they don't have, and they go into medicine. I, I see uh, ministries, ministries of health around the world, in the developing world, as, as you well know, you know, are controlled nursing education, but ministries of education um, control medical education. And they have very different purposes. And nursing, even in ministries of health around the world, is not given recognition and status. So. How can we, I, mean, I see what you say for interprofessional collaboration, and that's something that, that we in academics, you know, we, we, we can do. But for me, the missing piece of the puzzle is the policy, um, because governments control healthcare ed education in so much of the world. Thanks. I, I think you've written a chapter of the commission report there. I mean, I mean that's, that, that's exactly the sort of issue that we need to have work done to begin to shine a light on these, these obstacles. And I do think it's a natural follow-on from the, the, the high-level commission on um, professional education we had to look at these much more micro, uh, the micro detail that you're identifying. So I agree with you. Um, and that's why I think we need this additional piece of work, because these issues are not widely discussed, what you're identifying. We glibly say we've got, four, we've got a human resource gap of four million health professionals in the world. Um, well, that's meaningless to say that without going to the levels that, level of detail that you're identifying. And we need, that's what the, the next step is, I think, in the argument. That's a great point. Dean Privilege down here. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to shift the conversation a bit. And we have lots of disparities in, in this country in healthcare. So there are groups of people who are not receiving care. That's why the healthcare reform, and we know that race, education, age, and so forth are part of the reason for uh, why there are health disparities. We think about the UK as having a fantastic healthcare system, but we do understand that there are disparities there. Could you talk a little bit about that and who are the groups that are really vulnerable there and, and why and what's what UK is doing about it? Wow, okay, so in the next hour lecture, um, <laughs> Class is a word that um, we don't like to talk about in Britain, uh, but our society is riven by class, uh, and it continues to be so. Uh, we have incredibly low levels of social mobility, and part of the reason for that is the class structure that still exists. We have areas of urban deprivation that I was at a lecture recently, it was given by the most wonderful guy, not a doctor, not a nurse, not a public health professional, but actually a policeman. And he showed pictures, this was in um, Glasgow, he showed pictures from above the city of communities. And there were streets, and he told the story of a young man called David, where he, he was born in this street, and then he grew up. And on, in his street, the next door neighbors were dealing in crack cocaine. Um, somebody else was you know, running some local protection racket. Then there was prostitution. I mean, basically, he was living in a community that he couldn't escape from. He was trapped. And so he got into crime. He got into domestic violence issues and so on and so forth. And we have a health system and a political system that is utterly devoid from addressing these larger social issues. Our health system has many good things about it, and equity is definitely one of them. But we've separated health from issues of politics, economics, and social care in ways that have isolated health from some of the larger predicaments of society. It doesn't matter how fantastic your hospital is, how great your general practitioner is. If Dave is living in a street next to crack cocaine dealer, etc., 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 it doesn't matter. He's, his life is going to be destroyed by the community he lives in. So unless we think much more radically about the health professional as, a, as an agent of social change and even political change, uh, then I think we're going to fail as a society. And that's where we are in Britain today. We have entrenched class, a cl an entrenched class structure and a health profession that's, that has divorced itself from some of these larger social problems. And that's why I was so impressed with life. Sorry to keep coming back to that, but it has made an impression on me. Because there you've got a situation where you're integrating healthcare with social care, rooted in the community. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we don't do. And I know it's only one project, and you've got to scale it up and so on. But it's a fantastic example of how you can begin to break some of these barriers and, and help people like this notional David hold a hand out to him to walk out of these traps that exist in society. So, Afaf, let me invite you uh, to come and join us. Oh, no, okay, can't, no. You can't go. So, <laughs> Richard, again, we want to thank you for your strong voice. Uh, <laughs> your, your ability not only to articulate these issues, but put forward solutions and to use not only this kind of pulpit, but the pulpit of the Lancet, where the power of the pen uh, comes through so strongly. You're having a huge impact on the world, and we're, we're grateful for your visit to Penn and look forward uh, to tomorrow. Thank you very much. And, and we have a small gift for you to show our appreciation, and it's both from the School of Nursing and School of Medicine, and there are Fantastic. a number of little things there, uh, <laughs> but we, uh, we, we don't want you to forget how pen, fan, how fantastic pen is, how much better That's it right. is than any other university. <laughs> <laughs> so we would like you to put it in your desk, put it in your home, right. wear it. <laughs> I'm intrigued. <laughs> uh, okay. We can't thank you. thank you enough on behalf of all, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.